heard on great radio stations all across America. It's the National Defense with Randy Miller and Jerry Newberry. This is the National Defense, Randy Miller, along with Jerry Newberry, Communications Director for the VFW, and Jerry, as always, our dedication. Hey, this show's for you, the men and women serving on active duty of the Guard and Reserves. It's for the millions of veterans out there, and it's for all their families. We're here for you. We love you. God bless you. So, Jerry, you know, we, we talk every week uh, about the, the military work ethic and uh, the lessons you learn from uh, from your time in service and and how those apply to, to life in general, right? You know, and uh, there's a new book out that is, uh, boy. I mean, you talk about uh, taking those lessons uh, not only from your military experience, but uh, in in this one case in particular, uh, from being a POW and using those as life lessons. And uh, it, it, boy, you got something. And yeah, yeah, let me say this up front. Having uh, read the book, yeah, that uh, the, the book uh, actually made me feel somewhat inadequate when it comes to leadership. Uh, yeah, just goes to show you you're never too old to learn a lot of things, and uh, from different places, right? You know, and uh, anyone who's in a leadership position, I don't care how long you've been doing it, you need to read this book. Yeah, it's uh, Colonel Lee Ellis is the author. It's a book called Leading with Honor, uh, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Now, probably one of the most unexpected places you think you'd learn a lot of lessons. But uh, let me tell you about this guy before we bring him on. He's the, uh, the founder and president of Leadership Freedom, LLC. He's the leadership consultant, keynote speaker in the areas of uh, team building, executive development, and assessment. And um, why, do, why do you think you need to listen to this guy? Well, early in his career, he served as an Air Force fighter pilot flying 53 combat missions over North Vietnam. In 67, he was shot down, held as a POW for more than five years in Hanoi and surrounding camps. After the war, he commanded a flying squadron and leadership development organizations before ret- retiring as a colonel. Lee's uh, military decorations include two silver stars, the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star with the Valor Device, the Purple Heart, and the POW Medal. Um, I think enough said, don't you think? It, yeah, it, uh-huh. it says a lot. Colonel Lee Ellis is our guest. Colonel, how are you? Oh, good afternoon, guys. I'm doing great. I hope you are. Yeah, you know, I was doing great until I saw the cover of your book, because, I mean, you see the cover of this book, and n- number one, it just... Uh, there's no way that you can stop looking at it. There's a picture of uh, uh, of somebody's two feet. One has a uh, uh, a boot or a shoe. The other is uh, barefoot uh, with several uh, stitches uh, and and obviously a, a foot that's uh, it's been ravaged. I, I mean, it, it's just uh, what what a great cover. First of all, just to to pull people in. Well, you know, guys, I think uh, the guys did a great job with the cover. No question about it. And when I first saw it, they had several cover designs for us to look at, and that one just really hit me hard mm. uh, in my emotions, and I was almost afraid that it was going to be too strong. Uh, it wasn't too strong for everybody else. They thought it was the right one, and as I thought about it more and more, I knew it was. The thing about that cover is it really reflects the hardship and sacrifice that one foot that's uh, lacerated and obviously gone through some tough times represents the hardships that we all go through, not just the POWs, although our feet did look like that after the first couple of weeks uh, because we didn't have any shoes or boots. But uh, it really represents the hardship we all go through, and I think the other side, that other shoe, is uh, the guy's wearing a suit. You can see the cuff on his trousers there and the dress shoe. Because we have to make that transition and bounce back. We have to be resilient, and we have to recover to what we can. And, you know, the reality is that Vietnam veterans actually came home uh, pretty scarred up. They didn't get a great deal of uh, welcome. In fact, they got uh, spit on and mistreated in many ways and abused. But they actually turned out to be that other shoe. They're dressed up, and they've uh, actually done uh, exceeded their peers in all areas of society. From an economic standpoint, uh, they've made more money, they've achieved more education, 
and they've risen to higher levels of success than the uh, general population as compared to Vietnam veterans. Now, a lot of people don't know that, but that's the reality. So in a way, that cover really represents what all veterans from Vietnam went through and how they've come back and really shined. And just to, to kind of illustrate that, Colonel, I mean, I work with a guy every week uh, right here, Jerry Newberry, who was in Vietnam and is now the communications director of the National VFW. So, I mean, uh, that just proves that point. But, I, but I'm still getting abused by you. Uh, unfortunately, that that does yeah. not that does not stop. That, you know, so I hope you, never go away. That's right. That's a weekly thing. I, sure. I, I was hoping you were listening intently when the colonel was speaking. Right? <laughs> yes, oh, and yeah. he was talking about you, <laughs> Colonel. Uh, you, you open this book up, and uh, it, it kind of immediately hits some someone between the eyes uh, because uh, of the question you ask: Can you lead with honor? And I think that's the uh, overriding theme of this entire book. Uh, uh, you ask the questions, uh, you know, the implication is there. Do you have what it takes to lead with honor? Yeah, I think that is a real challenging question. To be honest with you, everybody just assumes, oh, I'm honorable. Oh, I have high integrity. Oh, I'll do the right thing. But the reality is I think that it takes sacrifice to do what's honorable because there's always a tendency or an attraction to cut a corner when you, or to do something that takes the easy way out. And I think we need that encouragement. The message that we're trying to get out here is that, yes, you can. You can lean into the pain. You can do the tough and difficult thing, and you can be an honorable leader. Uh, but you, it, you will have to make up your mind. You'll have to be committed to it, and you'll have to walk to walk to be able to do that but it's very possible and uh, lots of leaders are doing it right and left at every day every day uh but it does take some commitment and it does take some forethought and planning to be actually be able to walk it out and uh from what i've been able to gather from the book and i plan on reading it again uh, i apologize i had to go through it pretty quick but uh i think this is something i'm going to be carrying around with me for a while um that uh, in order to lead with honor, first of all, you have to know thyself. Yes, that's chapter one, know yourself. And, you know, knowing yourself is really about being authentic about who you are, that you, you know you're not perfect, uh, you know your strengths, you know your struggles, you know what you're passionate about, you feel like you have a pretty good idea of what your purpose is, and you put all that together, and then you go march to your own drummer and be yourself. And leaders can lead with a lot of different styles. You don't have to lead like somebody else. You lead in your style. You look at CEOs or presidents or, the, you know, the guy who drives the bus or manages the shift it, down at the assembly line. It can do it with a lot of different styles. But there are certain prerequisites or certain fundamental things that do need to be done. And that's what I've tried to do here. There are 14 chapters in the book, 14 lessons. And these 14 lessons are things that people really need to be focusing in on every day in every area of life, in the community, even at home. A lot of these lessons apply right at home. In fact, uh, uh, we've had a lot of ladies read this book, and they are very excited about it. In fact, uh, some of our biggest champions are ladies who uh, want their husbands to read it. Hmm. Well, and Colonel, we're talking to uh, Colonel Lee Ellis, and the book is Leading with Honor. Uh, let me ask you this question. I just, I just heard this uh, today actually from, uh, from a former uh, NFL coach. And he's talking about uh, leadership, and he's talking about teamwork. And from from what you say in the book, your character, your your uh, authenticity, uh, your sincerity, and your knowledge of yourself has a lot to do with leading and and people following you. Um, but this just came up today, where a, a coach, when he was talking about the Tim Tebow trade to uh, to New York. He said, you know, in, in terms of, of, of a locker room perspective and, and guys following you, it doesn't have any, anything to do with that. It, it doesn't have anything to do with um, uh, uh, ability, uh, with, with how you uh, operate. All it has to do is that if you're successful, that if you're successful, that guys will automatically follow you. Do you believe that? I think that's true up to a point, in other words, until they really get to know you and see what kind of person you are. Um, and that's probably a little more true in, in those type of high-profile arenas 
uh, where the guys, uh, you know, go out and practice together and play together and then kind of have another life also. Uh, but I think over the long haul, and, and especially in business where it's a little bit different situation or in the military, uh, leadership is first and foremost about trust. Because if I can't trust you, I don't want to follow you. Mm. And so in order to have trust, you have to have character. You have to be able to be the kind of person that does what they'll say they do. Your walk matches your talk. People are looking for leaders who are authentic and who are real and are not afraid, uh, afraid of standing up for what's right. They want somebody who is going to be courageous enough to do that, even though you might be afraid, you actually stand up for what you know is right, and that is attractive to people. What what are the... um... What are the clues, you might say, um, to tip you off to Cyrus? Is that an instinctive thing uh, that people have that uh, they can sense that a, that a person uh, is fearful and is not willing to do the right things because of the fear factor? Well, I think so. They're, they start wondering, well, why is this person not doing what it seems to be obvious that they should be doing? And usually the conclusion is they're, they're afraid that, uh, that somebody will judge them or not like them or that they'll make a mistake, and uh, therefore they'll stand out and therefore they won't get promoted or something like that. In other words, mm-hmm. it's usually the doubts and fears that get almost all leaders in trouble. I've been coaching leaders uh, full-time for 12 years, going on 13 and uh, been part-time for another four or five years. And then in the Air Force, I ran two leadership operations in the Air Force uh, leadership development schools. So it's been a a big part of my life, and I keep seeing that doubts and fears cause people to either hesitate in making a decision or to make the wrong decision, uh, just to get off track in their leadership, and people start to notice that, and then the leader starts to lose influence. Or, Or make no decision. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, an important uh, part of well, our, our daily lives is communication. And as director of communications for this very large organization, it's naturally it's a major concern of mine. And uh, you touch on that uh, in your book. That uh, I, I always like to tell people, at least v- veteran groups, uh, uh, when I'm talking to them, that. Uh, you know, when you're out there in the grass and uh, you don't have any camo, uh, you know, you're dead. That's going to kill you. Right. Uh, and, and that applies to our everyday life and, and certainly the business world. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things, uh, the way I constructed this book is each chapter's got about six pages of POW stories. Some of them are mine. Most of them is me relating stories about the leaders that I followed. Uh, And then there's about four or five pages of here's the lesson and here's how it applies in today's uh, organization. Well, in in that chapter, eight is called Over-Communicate the Message. I talk about how the POWs had to fight so hard to communicate and use covert communications and codes, and there was always a risk of being tortured uh, if you were caught communicating, and that happened from time to time, or you might be put in solitary confinement. So we knew that we had to communicate in order to stay a team and to fight our enemy and resist them. Well, in today's business world, you really have to communicate through multiple media, and you have to over-communicate the message in in order for it to get out. Because if you get everybody aligned on the same message, now we've got something, we've got real teamwork, we've got cohesion, we've got people out there in the field that can make a decision because they know what the people at the top are thinking. I think you're right on. You've got to communicate, and it's even even more important today than ever before. We're talking to uh, Colonel Lee Ellis. Uh, the book is Leading with Honor. Uh, Colonel, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, talk about uh, some specifics of your days as a POW and your association with uh, Senator John McCain. And we continue right here on the National Defense. Welcome back to National Defense. Randy Miller along with Jerry Newberry. And uh, Colonel Lee Ellis is the author of the book, Leading with Honor, uh, Leadership Lessons from the uh, Hanoi Hilton. And um, Colonel, you know, there's a lot of talk these days, uh, especially with the uh, multiple deployments 
and um, and how a lot of the troops are coming back with just a lot of problems uh, transitioning back. How how did you go from your experience as a POW and 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 taking the attitude of of not not letting that defeat you, but turning that into something really really positive that lessons you could impart to others? Well, Jerry, I think there are a couple of things behind that. First of all, we had some time to uh, decompress, you might say, because the last two years of our incarceration, uh, it was more live and let live. The torture died down quite a bit, and so there wasn't that much going on in that regard. And it was more like we were locked up and minimum communication with home. So we had time to kind of settle down. Uh, lose some of the anger, deal with some of the bitterness and all that before we came home. Today's uh, troops, you know, they're flying in combat or fighting on the ground in combat or just living over there knowing that somebody might take a shot at them. They get pretty uh, hypersensitive, and all of a sudden, you know, one day they get on an airplane and fly back home, and they haven't had that time to really decompress, and they're back at work. So I think that makes a big difference for the POWs coming back, and... uh, I think now the government is spending quite a bit of money to try to get, come come up with some programs to help the veterans make those adjustments. I think I've tried to address that a little bit in my book uh, in talking about resiliency and also just coming back and some of the issues that I dealt with of uh, being hypervigilant, uh, having anger, a little bit more anger than I realized I had, uh, being controlling. Uh, you know, if you can control your environment, you can stay alive. That's what every military guy feels, I think. Well... You know, you can't control every environment, especially at home. You know, if you've got teenagers and a wife, you can't uh, control them right. the same way you can control yourself and your troops in combat. Uh, you know, uh, much of your book, or most of your book, is um, uh, you talk a lot about other people. And, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the examples they set, uh, th- things they did that uh, uh, stayed with you. Um, and, uh, first of all, I want to say this with all sincerity, we are very honored to have you on the show. Absolutely. Um, and we have the utmost, uh, respect and regard, uh, for your military service and, uh, certainly, uh, what you went through as a, a POW. Um, you, uh, and, and you are a hero. I, I, I know you're not going to step up and say that, but, uh, I, I will. Um, but you also uh, had the privilege of uh, uh, being with uh, a, a group of other men uh, who were equally as heroic uh, as you. So, some names uh, people know, uh, some they don't. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about a couple of those people? Uh, a- Admiral Stockdale, for example. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, he uh, was an incredible individual. Of, uh, he, I think he knew himself very well. Uh, he had a lot of inner strength and courage. Uh, he called himself a stoic in that he was always encouraging us to face the realities of where we are, never give up hope of the future, but we had to face the situation as it was. And he continually demonstrated courage. He helped set the environment and build the culture there uh, of living to the code of conduct, uh, bouncing back from torture, uh, backing the U.S. all the way, staying united through communications. There were a number of policies that he put out as senior ranking officer. It varied between some of the time uh, Colonel Robbie Reisner, our Air Force guy, was a senior rank. He was a senior ranking officer a good bit of the time. And sometimes he would be in isolation and have gone through torture and not be in the comm system. And then Stockdale or Commander Denton, later Admiral Denton, one of those two guys would take over, and Stockdale and Denton were very different personalities, very opposite, but both great leaders. Uh, Denton, a real um, extrovert, he's the guy that blinked torture on national right. in the press conference and eventually came back to the U.S. knew what was happening. Yeah. So we had these leaders who, you know, they couldn't sit in a penthouse. They went first into the firestorm, into the torture chambers, and they were broken, and they bounced back and continued to lead and continued to set tough policies for themselves and others. And they knew whatever policy they set, they had to live by. 
And that's what I think was so special about that situation was the great leaders that we had. And it went all the way down, almost without exception. We had some very strong leaders that always stepped up and provided uh, that honorable leadership of trying to their very best to live up to the code of conduct and do what was best for our country and the team of uh, POWs that were there. Well, and I want to talk about one of those other leaders, Senator John McCain. When we come back, we'll take a quick break. Back with uh, Colonel Lee Ellis right here on the National Defense. Welcome back to National Defense. Randy Miller, Jerry Newberry. And uh, Leading with Honor is the name of the book, uh, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. Colonel Lee Ellis is the author. Uh, Colonel, can you tell us uh, about your association with uh, Senator John McCain? I sure can. Well, I went down 11 days, was captured 11 days after Senator McCain, and we were in the same camp for about the first couple of months. What a lot of people don't know is that he was probably the most seriously injured uh, POW who actually came home. He almost died in those capture situation, uh, very badly injured, and then injured further by the Vietnamese uh, captors. Uh, but he did survive, and once they realized he was a son of a four-star admiral, they uh, actually tried to send him home early in 1968 as kind of a propaganda move. And uh, he refused. He said, no, we go home in, in uh, sick and wounded first in order to shoot down later. Well, he was sick and wounded and probably could have uh, justified coming home. But he did the most honorable thing in saying, I will go home when it's my turn. Hmm. And he stayed there. And first of all, they, they beat him up and tortured him. And he stayed in isolation and solitary confinement for almost another year. So uh, his great courage and resistance and continually was uh, setting a great example. Usually he wasn't the senior ranking officer in the camp, but he was the one that was getting the most attention quite often. So that means that he was in the spotlight and he had to lead, and he did a great job. Then uh, we, I went to another camp, and he did too. I went to Sante, he went to the plantation. But then in 1970, we came back together, and he was about uh, 20 yards away in the cell next door, a large cell. And then he moved over across the camp about 70 yards away to another cell for the next uh, year or so. So, And then at the end of the war, we were in the same compound together for about two months, and we actually walked up and down the compound together. And that's when I really got to know him face-to-face. And we chatted and walked every morning uh, back and forth in the compound for exercise. And then since the war, uh, we've remained friends. And uh, I put on a reunion for our group one year, and he did two years later. And, of course, uh, I did a pretty good job, and he did a fabulous job. <laughs> it was just very obvious to me that our leadership capabilities were very different. Well, I mean, uh, you know, you talk about guys that uh, uh, were in that situation that came back, uh, n- you know, not especially from from a POW situation, but just from, from Vietnam, that have established themselves and, and gone on and done some great things. Boy, what uh, what a powerful statement that is about Senator John McCain, huh? Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, they. but it's, it goes beyond that. I mean, Vietnam veterans and Vietnam POWs both have done uh, some great things in this country and served it very well. But obviously, Senator McCain is probably the best example I can think of. And he continues to serve well, uh, even uh, as a senior citizen. He's making a difference for mm-hmm. and speaking out about things. So I think that's that's very important. But, but uh, I just always want to come back and, and, and point out that, you know, there are a lot of lessons from all Vietnam veterans that we can learn. They have a lot to offer. They have offered a lot. And uh, a lot of heroes out there, uh, as you said a while ago, I really don't consider myself a hero. I was the youngest guy in the camp usually, or the junior ranking guy. And I was really following good leaders. And so I think there are plenty of them out there to look around and follow. Uh, so, Colonel, obviously you uh, believe that, that leadership can be learned uh, but you know there are many stories of the of the other kind of return too, where uh, guys come back and and uh, it, it goes the other way. Is, is that something that uh, is just a part of your character that's ingrained already, or is that something that you can actually learn from the ground up? Uh, it's both. I mean, obviously, some leadership characteristics are just in our uh, natural personality or 
genetics, whatever you want to call it, because you can go to a playground and watch seven-year-olds and see some people are leading. So there is something to some natural, instinctual leadership characteristics. But all the research shows and my experience shows that uh, you really can learn and grow and learn a lot about being a leader and be developed as a leader. And I've been doing that for many years. And so you, my goal is always to take wherever you are and take you to the next level and then the next level when I'm working with someone. So I'm a big believer in uh, we can all be better leaders. And uh, I've seen over and over again people who really had never been in much of a leadership role, but they moved in and they just – they learn step by step along the way, uh, and that's especially true if they have uh, a mentor uh, or someone who uh, uh, who sets the example for them. Uh, that, that I, I know that was the case for me uh, in the military. I had uh, I had some great uh, senior NCOs that uh, you know I, I practically worshipped the ground uh, they walked on. They kept me alive and. Uh, uh, did so many things to keep other people alive and uh, learned a lot from them. Um, are you going to be at this for a while? You're not giving this gig up for for a while, are you? No, no. I am. Uh, in fact, the book is just uh, really about to be released. It's uh, on pre release right now at leadingwithhonor.com, the website. But uh, it'll be rolling out nationally in all the bookstores and Amazon and, you know, all the online stores uh, here shortly in about uh, four or five weeks. So it's uh, it's going to be a, a big run for me, and I'm just thankful I have the energy and the health to uh, to go speak and do book signings and uh, kind of spread the message of leading with honor. I think that's what it's really about is the message. Well, I, I'm hoping you'll have opportunity uh, when you're out there on the circuit uh, signing books. Uh, Hopefully, you'll be able to uh, schedule Kansas City. I'd, I'd love to have you meet with some VFW leadership and, uh, uh, you know, just 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 to meet with them, and uh, uh, maybe we could set something up down the road. That would be great. I'd love to do that. I was in Kansas City last year speaking to a national conference, so a beautiful place. I'd like to come back. Great. And, Colonel, have you ever um, – do you meet people when you when you, you give your your talks and uh, and uh, your your instructions that just can't be leaders? You ever run into anybody that uh, just can't learn to lead? Yeah, I have. I I met some people that have, and uh, one they they don't know themselves or not strong enough internally. Uh, sometimes they uh, just they just really don't want to lead. In other words, if you're going to be a leader, you got to deal with people problems. You got to use psychology. You got to. You know, you got to be patient, and sometimes you got to be tough. Sometimes you got to be very relational. Sometimes you got to be the opposite. And a lot of people are just not willing to put that much energy into it. And so I try to encourage them, if they're not, to go ahead and do everybody a favor and get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's uh, the only right thing to do. Yep. I mean, you know, as far as uh, uh, with a company or a business uh, situation. Uh, and and what about the other side of that? What about some people who who didn't uh, think they could lead? That uh, maybe you've taken them from that uh, step uh, to become a great leader. Can you give us a couple of examples? Yeah, I think the real issue is finding that balance between relationship and results. Most of us are naturally wired for one or the other, but and so we have to learn. Uh, the other one. So if you're really good at getting results, then to be a good leader, you're going to have to learn to uh, listen and invest in people, develop people, those support people, those kind of things, and vice versa. So I've seen that on a number of occasions where it was just had raw talent that was good in one area, but once they see the light, so to speak, once they get it and see what they really need to do to be an effective leader and to see it's really about influence, that people show up to work every day, and what they really want to do is they want to make a difference. And they want to be valued and, and appreciated, but they want to make a difference and see that their life has meaning. And good leaders are able to help people see that what they're doing counts, that it matters, and their life has meaning, and, uh, and that they're important. And that also matches, though, has to match getting the results and accomplishing the mission. So it really comes down to what we learned in the military. You have to accomplish the mission, but you have to take care of the people. And and you have to be resourceful. You know, that uh, that comes across time after time. When we're talking to different companies that have learned 
uh, employing uh, military uh, is a, is a great thing to do because they have those systems. They they know about learning systems. They know about working with people, and uh, that just comes across so many times in terms of uh, the responsibilities and accountability that they already have uh, in in their character. Well, you use the key word there. It's responsibility. Because uh, if you're going to be a leader, you have to be willing to be responsible. And I think military people learn about duty and responsibility early on. And that is, I think, one of the things that sets them apart, or any leader, is being able to be responsible and own, own the job, own the mission, own the business, whatever it is. Well, I've, I've read a lot of books on leadership uh, during my career, but i got to tell you, Colonel, this one uh, struck a chord with me, and uh, I, I think this thing is going to get a lot of use Yeah, and uh, be dog-eared. Uh, so I, I might be giving you a shout uh, down the road, send me another book, because I'm always looking for freebies. <laughs> All right. If you bring that one out, I'll give you another one. All right. <laughs> well, you know, you've got some great uh, – you talk about some of these uh, people that – uh, have commented on the book. Uh, uh, these are some big time, yes, you know, they are. Yeah. Fortune uh, 500 uh, uh, heads of companies here that uh, have have learned and, and recommend this book highly. R- read them off there. And well, I mean, this is a great for the BB and T Banking School, BB and T University, John uh, Lowe in professional development programs. And then you've got uh, Ed Day, the president and CEO of Mississippi Power Company. I mean, you know, these are some big time guys that uh, have uh, have stepped out and said, this is the guy that you need to listen to. So uh, obviously, uh, very impactful for a lot of people, Colonel. And, and Mr. J.L. Newberry. It right. says it, so it's got to be so. And I, and I, I didn't that's see it. your I didn't see your name in well, here. Well, that's an oversight. That's sure, right. Sure oh, is. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, guys. It, uh, I've been uh, I've been honored and pleased by the book's reception uh, through the military and through corporate areas and not for profits and schools and universities. I just got another endorsement in. It'll be in the next uh, printing, but uh, from a fellow who's been in leadership development in universities and schools for a long time. So it has been well received, and I just feel very blessed to have that happen. Colonel, you're a, a great leader, a gentleman, and an American hero. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. It's been a real pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Randy. Thank you so much. Leading with Honor is the name of the book, Leadership Lessons from the uh, Hanoi Hilton, uh, Colonel Lee Ellis. Man, you're right. That guy, national hero. Uh, absolutely, Randy. You know, that that whole group of men who, who went through so much. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, there's there's fewer and fewer of, of them every year, but uh, you know what a what a group that the things they went through. But it would be so easy, you you know, to come back and say, "Poor me, I, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna go down in a hole and I'm not gonna come out again." Yeah. And, well, yeah, 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 right. You know, yeah. Well, we have to be upfront. Not all of them fared so well no right yeah right you know but but that's why it's so special a guy like this colonel lee ellis yeah. comes out and and then devotes his the, the rest of his life uh, and john mccain and, yeah and, and, right you know there's there's a lot of examples there that that we're overlooking that uh, you're right that they, they came home uh managed to they didn't forget about it right because those are oh, those no. are things that I, I think help form uh, what yeah. they eventually uh, accomplished and became.